So all of this is really interesting, but you might be wondering now, why did I select the Schweiber formation as an example of a humid ramp? What is the evidence here for humidity? After all, the Middle East was a warm sea. It was a shallow sea, it was quite warm. There's evidence that probably it was slightly saline. We did some work uh, on isotopes um, in this region that suggest that there was probably higher than normal salinity. So that means evaporative condition. So why is this a, a um, good example of a humid ramp? Well, it is because what we know what happened at the top of the Schweiber. We know that it's basically exposed and tilted. There is evidence for a very subtle regional tilt. And then we have the formation of, a, of an unconformity, a very important unconformity at, at the top of the Schweiber. And towards the Bab Basin, we have evidence for these low stand wedge being formed. So again, following the, the absolutely classic model I showed you before, we can see this at the outcrop here in Oman. But what's really interesting is when you look at this unconformity, we see evidence for meteoric diagenesis. In other words, we see evidence for dissolution, karstification by meteoric water. And you can see this here very clearly. These are cavities that were dissolved in the carbonate and filled then by fine silt. And in fact, the meteoric diagenesis, so the meteoric dissolution of the limestone at the top of the Schweiber is one of the reasons why in Oman the Schweiber is such a good reservoir. It's because of this meteoric dissolution that the top Schweiber is, it's a very thin zone, but the top Schweiber is one of the biggest oil fields in Oman. So that is a proof that the uh, Schweiber was deposited in humid condition, but it's also very important in order to understand the reservoir evolution in this region. If you look at the uh, porosity versus permeability plot, this is a plot by Gerard Warlisch, who used to work for PDO, so that was published in 2010. PDO is Petroleum Development Oman. And you can see that the best reservoirs, uh, the ones that are basically you know, good permeability for relatively good porosity are in the Lithocodmium bacinella, so the bacinella mounds, uh, but also, of course, in the rudists. So the rudists uh, foreshoal um, are rudstone, and these have really good permeability. You can see very high permeability, close to one Darcy, in fact. And we also have some waxstone and mudstone that typically are fine-grained lithology and typically would not be best reservoirs. But thanks to that meteoric diagenesis, they become uh, excellent reservoir. So that's well, really well illustrated here. You can see that here we have potential seals in blue and potential reservoir in yellow and orange. And the potential reservoir are the buildups and the grainstone area of the uh, Schwaiba formation because they contain both primary and secondary porosity. So primary intergranular, interskeletal uh, porosity um, and secondary by moldic porosity or vuggy porosity. And then on the slope where we have those pack stone and those, those wax stone, those finer lithology, the only reason these are good reservoir is because of secondary porosity enhancement. So that already gives you a little taster of why we need to understand diagenesis, which we will do uh, in a few classes. So obviously, if you look at where the wells are positioned now in the Schwaber Formation of Oman, you can see that most of them, the wells are the black line, most of them target those red and orange lithologies, and those red and orange lithologies are the build-up core, so those are the rudest build-up, and the floatstone, which are basically the four shoals of um, the rudest. And some of the wells are actually targeting the mudstone and waxstone because of enhanced porosity thanks to the, the, the meteoric diagenesis. And that's only possible, again, because these rocks were deposited in meteoric conditions. So that in the lower Cretaceous, when the rocks were exposed, they were subjected to a meteoric diagenesis. Now, of course, every reservoir needs a seal. And in the case of Oman, we have one. After this tilting and meteoric phase, the carbonate production was reduced in part because we start to see the 
uh, advance of a clastic front coming all the way from the Arabian Craton in Saudi Arabia and progressing everywhere in the Middle East, not just in Oman. This is really a regional uh, depositional trend. And, and that leads to the deposition of fine grain sediments in, uh, on top of the Schreiber Formation. And this is a mix really of carbonates and clastic. At the very top during the transgression, you have a little bit of carbonates being deposited, like muddy, fabric muddy carbonates in, uh, in the uh, formation above. And that formation is known as the Nar Umer formation, and it's a clay-rich formation. And it becomes progressively deeper before it starts to shoal again. So here's an example in the field of the Nar Umer formation. And this is really one of the students favorite stops in the uh, Oman field course, in part because in the Narumer formation, you can find a lot of fossils. So I'm showing you here two of these fossils. I'll come closer, have a, a better look. And these are not the largest fossils uh, we found. In fact, the largest fossil ever found at this particular location, I mean, uh, that I am aware of, was found by one of our master's students. Her name was Maria. And you can see her here holding that absolutely massive gastropod. And you can find all sorts of different fossils, including some ammonites. Here on this picture, you can see the top of the Schreiber formation, just to make sure that the point is, is clear. This top of the Schreiber is where we have evidence for meteoric dissolution in the lower Cretaceous. And above you have the Narumer formation, and that's the top of the Narumer formation. And above the Narumer formation, in Oman we continue with the deposition of, uh, of um, carbonate, and in fact this is known as the Nati formation. And specifically for Oman, the Nati formation is a great reservoir. There's a lot of petroleum deposited in the uh, Nati formation. So you have the Schwaiba and the Nati are both reservoir units. So that brings me to my conclusion for this particular class. So when we have an attached system, there is no drowning possible. The carbonates can always retreat to higher ground. And that's the case here in the Schreiber Formation. It's the case for any attached system, whether you're looking at a ramp or a platform. But because you're attached to a continent, you can have the progradation of clastic system on top of the carbonates. And if that happens, that can actually shut down carbonate production. When you look at ramps and platform, even very large ones like the Epiric ramps slash platform of the Middle East, you can see subtle geometries such as clinoforms that I've shown you here in the, um, in the Schwaiba formation. And of course, the reefs and the shoals are important. We've seen that we can have reefs and shoals at the very front of the system. So those are the true barrier to the strengths of the ocean, to the wave crashing from, in this case, the, uh, the Neotetis Ocean onto the, the shoreline. But you can also find reefs and shoal inside the lagoon, as we've discussed before. And one thing that is characteristic for these um, humid conditions is the development of broad tidal flats. So tidal flats are quite common in these types of settings. And also we can find algal carbonates. So that's it for the Schweiba. We're going to have to leave that beautiful desert location for our next class, because next we're going to study what happens to ramp and platform attached to continent in arid condition. And for this, I will take you back to the U.S.